All right, well, we're very happy to welcome back uh, Xiao Xuan Li, uh, and he's going to tell us about ESPs, truncation, validity, and uncertainty. So, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, <laughs> yeah, thanks, and uh, nice to see you again. Yeah, so today I'm uh, going to talk about this uh, effective field series and uh, uh, the subtlety related to it is truncation, uh, validity, and uncertainties. So uh, this is uh, based on uh, this recent work uh, last year posted uh, with Oregon people and Tim Cohen and his student, uh, Joe Doss. Um, so in uh, before I start, I just want to say uh, a few sentences, uh, basically a, a disclaimer. So uh, I typically find that there are two large main groups regarding um, this work we did last year. So not, not all the people, uh, but uh, many people fall into those two categories. So they either think this work is trivially correct or they think this work is trivially wrong. So, uh, so that's why um, I want to warn you about this. Um, uh, if during my talk, like, like this hour talk, you could have, uh, if you belong to the first group, you could find that, you know, uh, all I'm saying is so trivial and uh, trivially correct. Then you would be wondering like why this guy will talk about this, this such a trivial point for an hour and then, so if that's your case, then uh, that's great for me. And uh, uh, let me apologize in advance for you know wasting your time, but uh, I will just beg you to bear with me and uh, just uh, um, um, let, me, let me finish the talk. And because there's also this second group of uh, audience who you know, think my, this work is trivially wrong. So it's like they think this work is completely ridiculous and doesn't make sense at all. Uh, so that, that's why I need to make, a, make an hour talk for that. Um, so if you belong to the second category, you will probably find my talk is completely nonsense. And in that case, please also allow me to finish the, the talk. And uh, we can discuss the details of things like all about your complaints afterward, you know, in, in the discussion section part, hopefully. Um, okay, so uh, let me get started then. Um, so today, why I'm talking about this, this subject, truncation, and the validity related to truncation, and also the uncertainty uh, brought by the truncation of a effective field theory, um, it's because uh, this is an area of research that has a growing attention in recent years. So if you just go to uh, Inspire and you search SMAFT and LHC, in the literature, uh, that is standard model effective field theory at the LHC, and you will find this uh, uh, plot. Uh, you see that there are something like from 2015 to 2022, that's this year, there are something like about 170 papers, and you see clearly uh, the number of papers is increasing uh, in the past few years. Uh, so I'm saying uh, more and more people are working on using uh, standard model EFT uh, at the LHC. And that's the, uh, the, the trend. However, uh, this is uh, not a, a subject that without uh, any uh, uh, subtleties, uh, it's highly controversial. Uh, for example, if you just look at uh, on the archive, and this is a paper posted uh, just uh, this year in January by the LHC uh, Effective Field Theory Work Group. Uh, this is a note of that. And the title is Truncation, Validity, and Uncertainties. So let me read you the abstract of this, uh, this note. Right? It says the following. The truncation of the standard model effective field theory, its validity, and the asso associated uncertainties have been discussed in meetings of the LHC EFT work group. Proposals were made by participants to address these issues. No consensus was reached and no formal recommendation is therefore put forward at this time. None of the proposals has been approved or validated and further work is needed to establish a prescription. This note aims at summarizing the proposals and points of debate. 
So this this one is posted just uh, you know less than two months ago. It's January twelfth uh, to the archive. So as you can see, uh, this the the on this uh, list of authors, there are many experts on SMAP and um, you know the uncertainties uh, of EFTs. So clearly, this is a highly controversial uh, subject uh, till today, and uh, that's why uh, I'm here to give a talk and to uh, uh, provide my own perspective on this. Okay, so to understand why this is a, 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 such a controversial subject, let's uh, briefly recall what is a standard model effective field theory. So it's like this. So we know the standard model, there are this elementary particles so far discovered. And uh, in standard model, we describe them, each of them by a field, like, like in this table. And they satisfy this uh, uh, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 symmetries. And you write down all the allowed uh, interactions up to mass dimension four, and you get the standard model Lagrangian, and that's the standard model. And standard model effective field theory is just uh, further supplementing this Lagrangian by corrections from higher order effective operators. Namely, you no longer truncate the uh, dimension four, but you allow for dimension mass dimension five, six, and seven, and so forth, uh, higher dimensional operators. And when you do so, you still uh, request that uh, the, those effective operators are built out of the standard model fields and they respect the standard model symmetries, um, but they are just higher dimensional. And to get a, a feeling of what it looks like, uh, for example, at dimension mass dimension six, for one generation of fermions, you can see here is a table of baryon preserving uh, dimension six uh, uh, effective operators in, uh, in SMAP. Um, so uh, famously, we know there are 59 uh, uh, effective operators and uh, 76 real coefficients here. So that's to give you a sense, what are those uh, effective operators? And uh, if you don't stop at dimension six, you can go to dimension seven, eight and higher, right? And uh, f uh, a, a table of the how this number grows is here. And you see that the number grows exponentially with the mass dimension. So here is dimension six. You see we have 84. Uh, that is 76 plus eight. That's uh, uh, including the baryon violating uh, uh, effective operators as well for one uh, generation of fermions. The upper line shows three generations of fermions. Um, so you see very quickly the number grows out of control. So for any practical use of the SMAP, you really need to truncate this uh, EFT at some mass dimension, say dimension six or dimension seven or dimension eight. Okay, so we have to truncate. And the idea is that uh, because this is growing as a mass dimension, uh, but SMAP is a low energy effective field theory. Uh, so it's okay to truncate at certain dimension because higher terms you ignore, uh, you, you neglect, uh, uh, contributes uh, uh, very small because they're surprised by some factor like this. So you have some heavy particle with capital M as the mass and your procedure in, in your experiments is uh, characterized by this uh, energy. And then higher uh, dimensional operators are uh, contributing through this, this factor. And if that's much smaller than one, so their effects are, are tiny and negligible. So that's the basic uh, uh, idea. Uh, however, is this really true? Can you really truncate maps, for example, at dimension six or dimension eight and ignore the higher uh, dimensional operators? So you, if you go to dimension 10, then this is a, 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 a six power. But the question is whether this quantity in the parentheses is really small. And uh, the reason why this is still a controversial subject is that this factor, is not, it's not clear if this factor is small or not. Uh, for example, uh, we can uh, take a look at the most recent global fitting results. And you see typically uh, they can bound the size or the scale of new physics at a few TeV. So namely we have no from just purely the global fitting, we have no knowledge that uh, there's no particle sitting around like a 5 TV, 8 TV at that, for, for that mass. But on the other hand, we know that at the LHC, the center of mass energy uh, gets as high as uh, 14 TeV. 
right? So there is a chance that your energy regime of the experiment is really actually bigger than the new physics scale. So that causes this, all the subtleties of uh, a validity issue of SMAT at the LHC. Um, so for example, <coughs> there are papers uh, just uh, complaining about this issue uh, in the past few years in like this uh, vector boson scattering examples. And when they analyze higher, uh, uh, you know, the tail effect in the search channel and they say, Truncating at dimension six is not sufficient and it, it, it's just not valid. The analysis is wrong. Um, so that's why uh, today we're still here talking about this uh, validity issue and uncertainties brought by truncating the SMAP at the LHC. So, in particular, as this uh, LHC effect, uh, uh, EFT work group emphasized, uh, we need further work to establish a prescription. And so that's uh, what our work uh, with Tim and Joel last year uh, was trying to, uh, we were trying to make a small step in this direction. Um, so in this paper, we're basically, and also in this talk, we're basically trying just to answer this following simple question. We're, we're, we're making a first step. So <clears throat> we're asking the following. So LHC has 14 TeV center of mass energy, but then there's still possibility for a UV particle uh, with a few TeV mass. Then in this case, does the 14 TeV center of mass energy, which is higher than a few TeV, does it immediately invalid the SMAP? So is there any chance for SMAP with a U BSM scale five, eight TeV still a good approximation, good framework to describe that kind of physics at the LHC searches with you know, up to 14 TeV center of mass energy. So we're just trying to answer this uh, simple question. And uh, the answer is no. The answer is uh, we could have some uh, uh, examples or cases that SMAP can be used still at the LHC, okay? Uh, but there is a lore in response to this question. So many people will tell you this, like it's okay it's still to use SMAP, especially those people working concretely, practically with dimension six, dimension eight effective operators and do analysis at SMAP uh, at the LHC. They will tell you, although LHC goes up to 14 TV, but um, you know, it's a distribution. It's uh, you only you don't know the exact value of the center partonic level of center of mass energy is uh, in between zero and uh, fourteen, but the PDF effects because the PDF is shaped in such a way, so it surprises a higher uh, energy events, and so in the end, on average, the effective uh, center of mass energy at the LHC searches is only like two TeV. So with you know, 5 TV, 8 TV mass, uh, UV particle, SMAP is good enough. Um, you know, some people will tell you this answer, but this is uh, obviously very sketchy and uh, not a, a detailed analysis, not a, a well-established uh, well analysis. So our work is aimed at just uh, investigating this argument more carefully uh, with a toy example. So that's... Um, that's what uh, I will tell you about in this talk. Um, so actually, we will just uh, uh, try even just answer a uh, very simple part, uh, small step in, in this part uh, in this talk. Um, so here is an outline of that. So in this talk, I will uh, just be very you know, less ambitious. Uh, I, I will go through the following few steps. First, I will briefly review the basic spirit of EFTs and emphasizing that they're meant to be low energy approximations. Of course, there are EFTs like SCAT, which is for you know, uh, other you know, the suppression parameters for other quantities. But in this talk, right, we are talking about SMAP, so that, which is uh, an approximation in the low energy sense. Uh, then uh, I will emphasize because they are designed as low energy approximations, so naturally, its validity is obviously like it's valid in low energy regime and it's invalid in high energy regime, right? 
Okay, but that's all. So you can tell the validity of the EFT very straightforwardly, but that's only when you know the precise value of the energy, right? You know, you have concrete knowledge about the energy regime of your experiments. Then I will move on to ask this question, like what if you don't quite know in which energy regime you are? Okay, you're, 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 you're a mixture of low energy regime and high energy regime. Then is then the EFT is still a good approximation of the UV theory, right? Then I will tell you that sometimes it, the EFT could still be valid, but this becomes a more detailed and subtle question. So to answer this question, then I will go to the third part. Um, I will tell, uh, uh, I will show you the comparison between the EFT prediction and the UV prediction. So I will basically take a very simple toy UV model and with the heavy particle being something like 8 TeV mass, and then integrate that out to get the specific EFT corresponding to that UV model. And then to demonstrate that EFT is a good approximation of the UV theory, I compare their predictions and show you when the EFT is a good approximation. As you will see, the answer is not that simple. It's, it's, it's somewhat interesting, at least to me. But this is by a particular comparison between the EFT and the UV. And then once we establish the sense that the EFT could still be valid as some, as in some cases, then we ask the following question. Can, can you tell the validity of the EFT by just looking at the EFT itself? Namely, I hand you the EFT Lagrangian without telling you which UV theory it comes from. Then can you judge if that EFT Lagrangian is valid? Then we, I will show you, we can use perturbative unitarity bound or unitarity con condition for the EFT to tell or roughly tell like as a hint for its validity. It's not exactly the same as this direct comparison between the EFT and UV, but it's a fair, it's a pretty much pretty good uh, hint for the validity. And finally, uh, if you know, you, you can buy this arguments, um, I will show you that the, the whole Analysis is, is back to this question is based on the situation where we don't know the exact uh, uh, energy regime, right? We're in a kind of a fuzzy uh, energy zone instead of a sharp. So uh, the, this, all this analysis, right? It has some dependence and sensitivity on, you know, what experiment you are talking about. If you sharp your energy bin and make it like, concrete, then of course you lose this subtlety, right? You, you, you no longer face the subtleties, right? So that's the, uh, the outline uh, of this talk. Okay, uh, let, let, let me get started then. The first part is to reveal the basic spirit of, of EFT. Before we even go to a EFT, let's talk about the effective theory in general in physics, right? Not just the uh, effective field theory. So here is an example we all learned from kindergarten. It's like, you, suppose you have a ball, small ball of mass M, and you just, uh, it stays still there and you let it go from a stationary and let it fall freely to the ground. And suppose you release it at a height from the ground of, of height H, and you ask when it, uh, right about to reach the ground, what's the velocity, what's the speed of it, right? Then we know how to solve that, right? You just uh, say that the potential energy MGH equals the kinetic energy when they just about to hit the ground. Then you solve this, you get the V square is 2G times the height H from, from the ground, right? That's, that's the standard way we solve this problem. In this way of solving the problem, you're using an EF, uh, effective theory because you use the fact that the potential energy is some constant, which doesn't matter, plus this Mg times this H. That's the potential energy of this, uh, this ball, right? Then this is an effective description of the potential energy, right? Um, because in the full Newtonian mechanics, we know that the, the, the actual uh, uh, potential energy uh, for this, this ball is uh, due to the, the Earth's gravity is given by this expression, where this G is new, new, Newton constant and Me is the mass of the Earth. And uh, this is the mass of the ball. And here, in the denominator, you have the Earth's radius plus the, the h, the height from the ground, right? So that's the full expression. 
But what you did above is just you expanded this expression in powers of little h over capital R sub e, then into a, a power series. And if you keep up to just the linear power, then you, you re reproduce the above expression, right? You dropped all the higher powers, um, then you can identify that this uh, 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 little g is given by this uh, g Newton times the uh, mass of the earth divided by uh, r e square. Um, then you recover this one. So that's an effective theory of, of the gravitational uh, potential energy. Uh, this effective theory, this expansion, uh, the, with this truncation and the linear order is a very good approximation if uh, the height from the ground, little h, compared to the, the, the radius of the Earth is very, very tiny, and which is typically true. So in this case, you can drop all the higher powers uh, and just use this, right? So we practically know that that's the way we solve this problem every day when you teach or write your introductory level physics, right? You don't go back to this, this expression, this, this full one, because that's a very good EFT uh, in practice. But when little h is sizable compared to the radius of the earth, then you become, right? This expression is no longer good and you become concerned. So then you need to include more powers of this series to improve the approximation. So uh, we know that as long as little h compared to R e is smaller than one, you can systematically improve your approximation by going to higher and higher powers in this effective theory, right? Because you will get closer and closer to the true theory result. And then in this sense, we will call this effective theory a valid effective theory. Namely, although truncating at a particular order will give you some sizable uh, um, error or, right, uh, uh, um, but you can systematically improve it by including more terms in this expansion. And then, uh, but if H is bigger than RE, then your, this expansion is problematic because it's no longer convergent. So by including more and more terms, you will just get more and more wild and diverging uh, result. Then it cannot be used to systematically improve your approximation. Uh, in that case, we say this effective theory is not valid. Okay, so then effective field theory is the same thing, right? For example, the famous one is the Fermi theory of weak interactions. We know that in center model, we have W and Z bosons and uh, the tree-level amplitudes between the fermions can be given by this propagator. But then uh, you can shrink them to this contact amplitude uh, with this effective Lagrangian. And the way you get this, the basic spirit is the same as the previous uh, gravitational uh, potential energy example. It's like uh, stripping off all the other uh, 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 factors. The key part of this amplitude is this propagator factor, uh, P square minus M W or Z uh, square. And then this EFT, is obtained simply by expanding this propagator into a leading term and then the uh, powers of P square over M square. So this expansion is a systematically systematic way of improving your approximation if this P square compared to M square is small. So we know that WZ mass is something like 80, uh, 90 GeV. So as long as your experiments are way below or, or below that zone, then you can use this expansion to systematically approach um, your you know, uh, true theory or, or more uh, UV theory uh, result, right? So that is <clears throat> the basic spirit of effective field theory. Namely, we use it to approximate. Okay, then to look into this, let's even simplify this um, by just looking at a scalar version, scalar mediator version of, of the story. So suppose now, I, this is my toy model. So suppose now this is your UV theory. You have fermions mediated by some heavy scalar with some mass, heavy mass, capital M, M. okay? Then this is a S channel, um, right? Suppose you set up your UV theory in a way that at tree level, this is the, the only contribution to the amplitude, to this two to two scattering amplitude. 
And uh, so uh, it could be helpful, like if you keep in mind that the initial state is different from the final state. So initial state could be quark and anti-quark, QQ bar. Final state can be some other fermions, uh, some new fermions, light, dark matter fermions, beyond standard model and so forth. Um, so there are many other factors like uh, in principle, right? The, uh, the fermion spinner factors and, and so on. But the key factor is again, this propagator. So uh, S hat means uh, it's a partonic level center of mass energy uh, in this case. Um, now the EFT, once you integrate out this capital phi, this heavy field, again, you get this uh, contact uh, effective operators. And practically that is just uh, expanding this propagator into the series as before, right? So you, so you get this expansion. And uh, so <clears throat> the question we, we want to ask is, is this EFT a good approximation of your UV theory? So of course you compare the prediction on the cross section of this two to two scattering you know, uh, from you compare the EFT prediction with the UV prediction and check how good is that? Is that a good approximation, All right? Uh, so here is a result. So if you just do that, and uh, so this I'm plotting the uh, approximation error, namely I use the EFT uh, prediction of the cross section divided by the UV and subtract one and take the absolute value and plot it like this. So in particular, I chose M, capital M to be 8 TeV. This heavy particle is 8 TeV. And now I look at a few cases, like S hat is 2 TeV, 5 TeV. So those two cases, they are smaller than eight and or 14 TeV, which is heavier or bigger than eight. So you can see clearly for the 2 TeV or 5 TeV case, as you increase your truncation order of the EFT, or the mass dimension of the effective operator, uh, you see you get a better and better approximation, namely the, uh, the, the approximation error goes to zero uh, exponentially. And similarly for this uh, 5 TeV case, but if you are above 8 TeV, if uh, root S hat is 14, then it becomes it, it, it's diverging and worse and worse. But this is, uh, uh, this, we, we just get the simple conclusion that when this center of mass energy is smaller than M, you're fine. When the center of mass energy is bigger than M, it's not good. But this is very intuitive and straightforward as we expected, right? Uh, because the EFT is a low energy approximation. If you're in low energy regime, you're fine. If you're not, it's a disaster. And in either case, the curve is very straightforward, very simple, right? So that's uh, that's how we quantitatively see uh, if the, uh, the EFT is a good, good approximation of the UV theory. Okay, so this is what we observed in, the, in, the, in this case. <clears throat> but now that finishes the review, then now let's ask our key question. What if you are in a situation where you don't know the precise value of, uh, of this S hat? So that is, you are not 100% in the low energy regime, but you are not also not 100% in the high energy regime. You are kind of in a, in a, in a mixture, right? So, so that is, we don't know the exact value of this S hat. Then what will happen, right? For example, that to give you some um, uh, 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 intuitive uh, 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 sketch of, 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 the, of the situation I'm talking about, it's like this. Suppose you have a experiment where you collect the events. But as opposed to the previous case, we're talking about S hat is precisely two TV or 14 TV. You now don't know the precise value. It's, there's 60% chance that this event comes from this two TV scattering. And there's 40% chance come from a 14 TV center of mass. Then, but my heavy particle capital M is eight TV. So then, what would you say? Is the EFT still valid or not? If you are totally in this bar, then you would say, oh, that's valid. If you're totally here, all, all of the events are from here, this 14 TV, then you'll say, oh, that's, that's not valid, right? Like, like we, we saw before. But now- I have a question. Mm -hmm. in, your, in any measurement, or that I see any experiment from the 
if you can measure with the act height, then there's no such problem, right? You will do the beam by beam measurement. So, for example, because let's say you have you know, let's say you have a double or double Z measurement. If you say the hydronic decay, let's say if you can measure the W Z uh, um, ball momentum, then you can measure you would have had directly. In that sense, I believe you can just do do B by B measurement, right? Yes. But of course, uh, bin by bin in each bin, there's still the fuzziness, right? No, so why, why do you do that? That's the value of root as head. Sorry. So when you, when you talk about a bin, you still don't know the precise value of has head. You still say has head is something like a 14, 13.99 to 14.01 TeV, right? So, <laughs> In spirit, it's still TV, two to three TV, three to four TV. Sure, right. I, I think he's asking suppose you have a special experiment where you can reconstruct the S hat. Yeah. But, so that, that's why this two to two scattering example, this toy case in my talk, is just a toy case for you to, uh, to, to understand the, the theoretical structure of the problem. But in reality, when you talk about three body, you know, kind of uh, procedure or more, right? It becomes typically often impossible to fully reconstruct the, the center of mass energy of the, or the, in that case, the uh, transfer of the energy relevant for the procedure, right? All the transfers of energy, if you're, you're in a more complicated structure, right? So it's often- uh, you're, 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 you're focusing on these uh, experiments, you cannot reconstruct the that type, right? Mm -hmm. That's your mm -hmm. book, yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. uh, transform momentum over the lack right. of decay or WD. Right. Why I cannot make a sorry? I have a meta graph. I can make a simulation to see uh for, for in the extreme case, let's say I can measure the the, the let's say uh, let's say take example, mm -hmm. uh, the diversion production WZ to three lifetime plus neutrino. Mm. And in that sense, uh, you, you, let's say you cannot uh, reconstruct uh, the, the, the root as height because that's mm. the energy you train, you, you, don't, you, you cannot measure the neutrino component. That's right. Uh, the component of neutrino. Mm. But uh, suppose I, I, I can measure this form momentum, I can measure left I can construct a kinematic variable uh, like uh, amount of mass over three, let's say, amount of mass over three left mm. Sure. Then I do a beam by beam analysis for the for this variable in principle i can pre, i can calculate the format graph what's the possibility uh by what the probability in each beam right? for example if i if in the if i put some card mm. on, on this uh, event matter of three lifetime mm. uh if i tune it in my part in principle i can change the probability or the or, or the how, how much probability of the Events of the attack uh, coming coming from. If I put some cut, do you think I cannot reduce the 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 the, the, the chance of the high energy of the SP? You 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 could. So, but <laughs> but you you need to remember, right? So if you sharpen your energy beam, you, then you lose statistics. I think also, I mean, even a true shot one, you're really addressing a question of principle. That's right, exactly. So yeah. I, mean, I don't think, you know, I think he's answering a question of principle. So why don't we see, because, you know, he's, you're, I think you're right. He's looking at cases where we don't know S hat completely, right? Then you're right. We can change it probabilistically by changing cuts, but we still have this question of principle. So, sure, sure. Okay. right? Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, of, of course you, you, you can reconstruct things and, and then, but then, um, you know, then, then you are in a perfectly fine case. Then you can say I'm at a lepton collider, then you know the center of mass energy from the initial state and then, right? <laughs> so it's just a matter of, uh, you know, in reality it's a matter of trading off the, uh, the statistics you have and, uh, you know, the energy resolution you have, right? But then here, uh, like Mark is saying, I'm, I'm addressing a in principle question. Like, suppose your experiment is a mixture of a low energy regime and high energy regime. Mm -hmm. Then, is the EFT a valid description? 
of the approximation of the UV theory, right? Okay. If you are totally in low energy regime, you're fine. If you're totally in high energy regime, you should discard the EFT. But now you, you have a mixture. Then what, what would you say? What, what should you do? Should you immediately discard the EFT or should you just embrace the EFT saying that, okay, I can use it? Or do you need something slightly more complicated as your judgment tool to tell if you can use the EFT? Uh, that, that's the question I'm trying to answer here. Uh, so, um, right, this 60, 40 is a little like a, a teasing value, but if like it's 90 and 10, I guess you would probably say, okay, it's fine because you are mostly here in low energy regime. So you would think, okay, then EFT can be used. Although it's contaminated by some high energy events, but it's a uh, time, right? What if you are 99% here and 1% here? Right, you have some, you know, cosmic ray uh, contamination, like, uh, right, and then so very largely, like, you're okay here, right? So you you need some kind of tool to tell you uh, when you can still use the EFT in this kind of scenario, um, and uh, more uh, <coughs> complicated situation is what if you don't have this uh, uh, just the isolated uh, uh, beans like. Right. What if your event is like you are totally like uh, uh, agnostic about your energy? You only know your center of, man, uh, center of mass energy is between two and fourteen TeV, and it's the, the probability is a distribution here with some row of s hat. Like in this example, it's a, a flat distribution. Or another case is like you have a different shape of distribution. Like it's more likely to be at the low energy end, but not likely at the high energy end but you have no other knowledge of your uh, center of mass energy. So what if you're in this situation, can you tell if the EFT is a good approximation or not? So to answer this question, our intuition is, right? A rough intuition is that, okay, I should look for some kind of average value of the, the center of mass energy when, when I encounter this case. And then just replace the previous sharper value of the center of mass energy with this rough average. Okay, so if this average center of mass energy is below uh, the mass, then it's in low energy regime, then I'm fine. If it's above, then it's, it's not fine. Okay, so then if this, following this intuition, then we, we see that if you have a distribution such that the average value of the center of mass energy is much smaller than the cap, the biggest value you, uh, you can achieve. Then even when the cap is bigger than certain M, like this ATV here, if, if root S is 14, but since this average center of mass energy is much smaller than that, you still have a chance that this is actually smaller than ATV, then the EFT could still be valid. And uh, if you look at the LHC without any like reconstruction of the energy or you know, without bending the energy, right? You just totally inclusive. Then you see that because of the PDF effects, then you're, you're sort of in this situation, right? That motivates us to do this analysis, like to answer this uh, theoretical uh, uh, in principle question. Um, yeah, so to really, see the result, right? We cannot rely on this rough intuition and, and calculate the uh, average value of the center of mass energy. Instead, uh, we should just uh, directly compare the EFT prediction with the UV and explicitly see when this approximation is valid, when it is not valid. So concretely, this is what we do. So now with this PDF distribution, right? This, uh, right? Remember, you know nothing about the center of mass energy. You only know it's within the regime uh, from you know, like 2 TeV to 14 TeV. And then you only know the likelihood, the distribution, the probability distribution of that is given by this PDFs, the parton luminosity uh, 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 functions. And then <clears throat> you calculate the EFT prediction of the 2 to 2 cross section and the UV prediction of the two to two scattering cross section. And you ask the, the following question. If I keep increasing my truncation order in the EFT, and then am I approaching this UV uh, result? 
right? You just redo the same thing as for the, you know, when, when for the case when you did know the, the S hat, but now with everything dressed up by this uh, distribution. Okay, then here um, is the result. If you sharply know, so this is like a situation where you bin your energy, you know your energy, or reconstructed your center of mass energy where you know exactly S hat is for root, root of S hat is 14 TV. In this case, for a few values of M, like three, five, eight, 10, they're all smaller than the 14. So of course, as, as we saw before, the relative error, the approximation error is blowing up and it's a it's horrible approximation. It's, a, it's not good at all. But now the real case is we only know the cap is 14 TeV and we know nothing about the concrete value of S hat. We totally have no bin of the energy or it's a whole bin okay, from two TeV to 14 TeV. Then uh, the whole bit, the, the distribution is governed by the PDF effect. Then you see this effect, right? So at least to me, this is an interesting behavior. It's not like, it's not like before, it's either exponentially blowing up or exponentially decaying. The error goes like this procedure. It first uh, decrease, and then increase, okay? So, so in our paper, we call this first case where you sharply know the S hat, the partonic case, where you, you don't know the, the center of mass case, the hydronic case. And you see that the hydronic case, right? This behavior of the, the approximation error uh, looks very much like an asymptotic series scenario, right? S say you're here at ATV, right? When you increase the truncation order of your EFT, right, your approximation actually becomes better and better initially. But after some point, it turns around and becomes worse. And eventually it wouldn't converge, it will diverge. But there are some intermediate steps that the EFT, including more go to higher orders is actually helping and uh, 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 improving your approximation. Okay, so this behavior <clears throat> the reason why I mentioned some topic series is that this is what we use practically every day. It's like similar to the perturbation uh, loop, loop order perturbation theory we all use in quantum field theories. Like, you know, the loop order expansion as a steepest descent uh, is not, a, it's an asymptotic series, not a convergent, converging series, right? But yet, you, you talk about tree level approximation, one loop and two loop, three loop, four loop five loop as an improved approximation. But you know, eventually if you go to one million loops, it will diverge and totally go well and doesn't make any sense. But it doesn't matter. It's still, you can use it practically at low orders as an improved approximations. So similarly here, in this case, you can use your EFT at truncated at dimension six, dimension eight, dimension 10. It's still helping you to improve your approximation as you can see from this curve. If I just plot uh, the, uh, without the absolute value, maybe it's more uh, uh, intuitively uh, 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 obvious here. So that, that's this uh, approximation error without taking the absolute value. So you can see the dots here. So zero is this line. So from the very initial uh, at the low value of the dimension or truncation order, it's really getting better. But after some point, it will, get worse and diverge. Uh, uh, th this is just like a symptotic series. So we see in this case, um, <clears throat> the validity of the EFT is not that naive anymore. Um, it's, it has a valid zone when the truncation order is low enough, but then if you go to too, too high of a truncation order, it's invalid. And if you want to understand why this behavior shows up just as an asymptotic series, right? Of course, this is not an asymptotic series, by the way, but it behaves like an asymptotic series. So if you want to understand the intuition of that, then you can roughly say something like this. So remember our intuition of this average value of central mass energy, but this average value it governs the relative ratio between terms in this EFT expansion. Like you have the fourth term, the fifth term, the sixth term, right? In this EFT expansion, then 
what really matters is the relative size between like the next term and the current term, right? And for this purpose, this average value depends on this truncation order k you're talking about. So um, because each term has this power, right? So then uh, the average value is given by this average and uh, uh, you further uh, take this uh, one over two k power. So when you do this, you can see it depends on k. So this is small when k is small, but as you increase k more and more, this s hat to the k power will dominate over this PDF separation. So in the end, uh, when you go to large enough k, this average value, it will become bigger than m. So that's why you have this uh, uh, diverging behavior in the end. But at low orders, uh, you're, you're fine. So that's basically the key uh, observation we see here in this work is that you can still use EFT as long as your energy being is sufficiently inclusive. You can still use your EFT, but only be carefully using it at low EFT orders. Um, okay, so- uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. This, this, this is this, uh, whatever your numerical result still based on the model you talked about earlier, right? Is that channel? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, is the same model you talked about earlier? Yes. And uh, what, what, what do you take it for your PDF? Some... The, the, sorry, what was that? What, what's your PDF? What do you assume to be your initial state? Oh, the proton PDF, the, the, the usual P, the proton PDF. No, I mean, do you assume it's a blue one or the quark? Oh, quark, quark. Sorry. The uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my um, the model is two quark uh here, okay. so the QQ bar, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, quark PDF. Yes. Um. Yeah. Uh. Okay. So. I assume it's the quark and anti quark, or you say two quark. QQ bar, quark anti quark. 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 Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a neutral uh, scalar mediator, capital phi, and no charge. Um, yeah, um, yeah, but it doesn't matter. You can, you can, you can see. You know, if you change that, this is like a qualitative, right? This understanding is likely this, this to be the same, right? It, it could change uh, at the quantitative level, but the qualitative uh, argument still holds. Right? That's the uh, uh, that, that's the anticipation. Um, okay, so. But this behavior, this uh, symptotic series-like behavior only holds, of course, for M, like below 14 TeV. If you are above 14 TeV, right, then no matter where you are for this S hat between zero and 14, right, you are all in this low energy regime, so it's, it, it's totally fine. So that's why, right, this is more obvious from this plot here. So again, this left panel is a partonic case where you see this, this dip here. So above 14, the series is converging as you, you go to higher and higher uh, mass dimension, uh, but below 14 is badly diverging. So this is a part partonic case where S hat is at 14 TeV. But now switching to the hydronic case where S is at 14 with the PDF effect, you see that for heavy capital M is still converging, but those low capital M mass case Right, like a 5 TV, 8 TV case, right? It's improved. It's like it behaves like being converging initially, but eventually it will go diverge like this. Okay, so this is just looking at the same thing from a different angle. Okay, all right, good. So now I've shown you by comparing the EFT with the UV prediction, you see when the EFT is valid. Now, the next question I want to address is. Can you tell this? Can you get a hint of this from just looking at the EFT itself without knowing the without comparing it with the UV? But the EFT I'm taking is still this particular EFT that corresponds to this specific UV model. I'm not setting free the EFT Volson coefficients yet. Okay. Uh, this can be done by using the perturbative unitarity of the EFT as a hint of that. So to see how this works. Uh, let's first reproduce the partonic case, namely when you know sharply the, the value of S hat. In this case, we recall uh, the previous slides, like we, we 
we by a comparison of the UV and the EFT, we, we saw this plot and concluded that when S hat is smaller than M, you're fine, bigger than you're not good. Okay, then the question now is, can we forget about the UV setup? Forget about the comparison with UV, but just look at the same EFT, still the same EFT. Okay, the specific EFT. Then can we directly tell that when S hat is smaller than M, it's good, bigger than M is, is bad? Then obviously you could because you have a series here. And then the series is blowing up for S hat is bigger than M. So of course you run into some disaster. Now, how do you show that the this disaster? How do you see that disaster? So you can use this unitarity condition of the EFT, and for example, um, uh, uh, revealed by 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 Chang and Luti um, uh, in 2019. So basically, here uh, the math is very simple. You truncate your amplitude, your EFT as some other, right? Your amplitude, and then you get the S wave component of that uh, with the proper appropriate kinematic factor. And then the S matrix should be unitary. So by that, right, you have a bond that the right the small square should be smaller or equal to one. And using this, you can tell when the series is diverging, then you break this uh, condition, right? So this condition tells you when you run into a disaster. Then it will tell you uh, when the EFT is roughly okay and when you know it's horrible. Okay, so implementing this, you will get this plot. Okay, now here you see this shaded region is excluded by the perturbative unitarity uh, condition of the EFT. So here you see if you're fixed, uh, like say five TeV of mass, then you go up, you increase your truncation order, like going up along this vertical line, then you will hit some point. At this point, uh, this uh, capital omega in this here will reach one. And then going further will, will be, uh, you will break that unitarity. Okay, so this gives you a hint on when you should stop. Okay. So just, but, just be, can I just add someone to your plot, just to make sure I'm reading it right. Mm -hmm. The horizontal axis, um, that, that's a log scale and it's in TEV. Yes. Grams. And so yes. I guess the lowest one is like, 100 around 100 this is 20 no no the, the lowest value i'm looking at the other end this one yeah it's about 100 gd or something Wait, one one I, this is 0 0.5 i think right 500 9 8 7 6 is 0 point, yeah 500 g yeah. so if i just if you kept going would the would the blue thing finally come down and Hit oh, three. no, no, no. It, it starts with six. So this is dimension six. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Okay. This is k equals okay. zero. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. of course, <laughs> then you go to standard model if you go to dimension four. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So then, uh, yeah. yeah so, yeah. question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when you take your entirety, you say it's taking the series, but uh, you take exactly the question is that they always all the coefficient being plus one or all every term because uh, it may depend on right each term corresponds to an average and think we only know the coefficient to all right. the one so right so it's, here i'm talking about still this specific eft i get from the, that specific uv theory i'm just trying to reproduce this this conclusion we obtained by comparing with the uv prediction but but not using a comparison with the UV, but just from the EFT itself. Uh, and in a very in a short moment, I will I will uh, comment on that. You know, when you set free those uh, Volson coefficients situation. But in your actual model, the signs alternate. I thought. No, in this S channel model, the sign wouldn't alternate. But if you have a T channel case, then it will. More and more this. And so, in in that, just to be clear again, the the, the saying it violates unitarity means that with the PDF, right? So with the no, th this is this is this is a partonic case. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, All I'm right. talking about the partonic case. So oh, in the partonic okay. case, you expect this sharp criterion, right? right okay. Here, I'm just trying to reproduce that. But you okay. see, it doesn't quite reproduce that because it doesn't shade all of the region with 
root root s hat smaller than 14 is roughly here, right? 14 is roughly here. So, right. Um, it doesn't shade all the reason, uh, all, all the 14 should be somewhere here, right? So it doesn't shade all, all of the, the same because, right? Because you're using your entirety bound, then if your k is low enough, then you can still survive that. The, 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 the mod square of this amplitude wouldn't hit one, right? So you, you have some, so that's why I was, I was saying, this is just a hint of the validity. It's not exactly giving you the, that, that same. But, it, but it's okay because ultimately you, what you care is the, if you go to the cross-section comparison between the UV and, and the EFT, right? At the low K, the error is also fine even when root S is smaller than L. So I'm saying this shading is not completely reproducing this naive criterion, but it's tracing the prediction error, the, the approxim approximation error in a very, very good way. So you see this curve, this uh, purple lines are the, uh, the approximation errors. So you see here is a solvent and the next line is 10 and the next line is 0 0.1. So you see roughly like it's somewhere here, right? It's zero. Then this, this last one is minus 0 0.9. Okay. So, you, so in this case, so you see, right? Um, as long as you're in the shaded region, you're brutally violating this. Uh, you're, you're getting a worse, uh, a, a very bad approximation uh, error. Okay, so that gives you a hint that when the, yeah, there, there's no goal zone for, for the EFT. But if you're not in that regime, you probably will be fine, although it doesn't, it, it's not completely safe, but, but, but you're, you're largely fine. Okay, that's what this unitarity bound is telling you. It's tracing this, uh, uh, this uh, error. Okay, so now why, why do we want this uh, uh, UV independent criterion just to tell uh, if the, the, the EFT is healthy from itself because this is a, a bottom-up criterion that is hopefully more useful because next you can go to the situation where you set free all those Wilson coefficients. Now I just hand you a EFT where I don't tell you which UV theory it come from. It's just a, the, the, the EFT result is here. Now you can apply the same logic to tell the entirety to draw the shade region of the entirety bond. But now it will be a multi-dimensional uh, analysis. It's not a, like, like this a two-dimensional thing because it has more uh, a free Wilson coefficient. You will shade a region in this uh, higher dimensional space of C1, C0, C1, C2, and so forth. And that's the region where the EFT is, is no good due to this uh, uh, entirety bond hint. And that's likely to tell you that the EFT uh, is not a good approximation of any UV theory. Um, okay, uh, so this is this is all good, uh, but then you need to figure out a way to apply this to the hydronic case. This is only the partonic case. So to go to the hydronic case, um, it's very again very intuitive. So this green part is the partonic case where we say this capital omega of S hat needs to be smaller than one. But now you just dress it up by, again, this S hat distribution, this inclusiveness of this, this energy and just average over that. But you need to probably normalize this, this uh, uh, probability distribution, of course. Uh, then you require that to be smaller than one. And that's your hydronic version of the entirety bond. Yeah, let's see. A, uh, if it works. So if you apply that, now remember this blue region is the shaded, the, the partonic case where S hat is 14. Now going to the real case where S is 14, but with the, the uh, LHC PDFs, uh, proton PDF uh, 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 distribution, now this entirety bound becomes this, this uh, yellow curve here. And again, you can see, right? If you plot again, this uh, approximation error, of the EFT versus the UV, you see again, this yellow curve is tracing that very, very well, right? This is a 1,000, this is 10, and this line is 0 0.1. And below that is zero is somewhere in, be in between, right? And then it, it becomes negative like a minus 0 0.2 and minus 0 0.7. So that's, that's saying if you're here, say five TV mass, then you go along this 
vertical line up, you're increasing your truncation dimension from dimension six, eight, 10, and so on. You are systematically improving your uh, EFT approximation until you hit this you entirely bound that tells you that, okay, come on, stop here. Because if you go further, you will go into this shady region, then it will go wild. Okay, so this you entirely bound con condition is a hint for when you know, don't go to a hundred loops. Okay, that's basically, okay. It tells you when to stop. All right. And let me also comment on the truncation uncertainty. Uh, so once we, if you, you can take this, then you can also get a, a, a I'm, I'm plotting this truncation uncertainty here, um, is that this is purely from the EFT. Then you look at the, if you truncate that at K plus one order instead of K, and you look at the next term compared to the partial sum and, and take the, uh, the, the absolute value, this gives you a hint of the uncertainty, right? So you truncate the EFT at K, then you ask, well, what about the K, K plus one term and that size compared to the partial sum up to K term? And then that, that's typically uh, the truncation uncertainty. And you can see the truncation uncertainty goes like this. Again, if you're in this valid zone, you go up, you see that the trunc truncation uncertainty is reasonable and it's also improving first and will later on get worse. So this truncation uncertainty is indeed to some level reflecting this real uh, approximation error. So namely it's, it's working as it's supposed to. Okay. So that's the saying that, you know, uh, you should, stick to this zone if you want to use math and don't go to arbitrarily high power. Okay, so that's uh, about this part. So, so, so far we finished the, the first two parts of this talk and uh, let me just comment, briefly comment on this last point that is now we should talk about the energy regime, the, the inclusiveness of that and uh, the uh, dependence on this. So what we have established is that if you have completely no knowledge apart from PDF itself about the energy zone, about the energy regime, then this is you know, a valid zone of your EFT, okay? But what if you change that, okay? Um, for example, you can impose a minimum cut saying that, okay, I toss away any event you know, below this 0 0.2 of root S or 0 0.3 or 4 or 5. If you do that, you're focusing more and more on the higher tail of your uh, search, right? If you do that, then you see close, uh, very quickly you close up this, uh, uh, this valid region. Right? That's as we are expecting, right? Because then you focus more on the high energy regime then PDF suppression effect is gone. And then, uh, so, so, so this is just telling you that using this unitarity bound, you can indeed see, right, the, the right uh, conclusion, right? If you now say I cut away any event below 0 0.9 root S, I just keep the bin from 0 0.9 root S to one root S, the, the highest energy bin, then you will just largely reproduce this, this line, right? Then it's saying you're reproducing the partonic case, right? So, so we're, our tool here, I'm just demonstrating to you that this is a tool that's working as one should naively expect. Okay. On the other hand, you can also uh, impose a high energy card bin. Uh, uh, let's say I truncate the maximum value of this energy regime by 0 0.7 root S or 0 0.6, 5, and 4, then you will get those, those curves. Okay, so you get better and better basically. And unfortunately, this low regime doesn't change much, but this higher ones will, 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 will shrink, right? So that you will get more uh, valid zone, but, that, but this is meaningless practically either. You, you never go to you know, dimension 30 in, one, in practice, right? So, so what we focus on is really here, right? Uh, so this is just demonstrating the method works as one should ex one expect it should. Um, Okay, <clears throat> so let me summarize about this talk. Uh, in this talk, I, I was trying to clarify the following few, uh, few points. First, design as a low energy approximation 
And EFT's validity critically depends on the energy regime of the experiments, as we should all expect. And second, then uh, EFT's validity becomes unclear if your experiment has a sufficiently inclusive energy regime, such as some channels at the LHC could have. Then uh, in this kind of cases, then the EFT series behaves like an asymptotic series and it, it's valid only as it low orders and then stops being valid at high order. So this is the key observation uh, in this work. And then finally, to get a hint of the EFT validity from using itself alone, you can check the perturbative unitarity condition of it and as a, as a hint for the validity. So, okay, that, that's basically my talk today. Thank you for your attention. So, um, so can I, do I understand? So I think what you're saying is that this is, uh, you're addressing the question of what you call validity, mm -hmm. right, of the EFT. And what that means is that for a, uh, for a particular observable, some kind of an inclusive rate, you're asking the question of whether going to higher orders in the EFT is making the error smaller or larger. Mm -hmm. And so the answer is basically, it's a yes or no question. Right? <laughs> and so if the answer is no, I think you would say you shouldn't try to do a search for that, right? But now if suppose the answer is yes, then you are not offering any specific guidance about how to do that search. So when you have a search, you need to know all your, you need to have estimates for all your sources of error, right? So you're not, you're not making any sort of proposal about that here. You're just I'm not there yet. Yes right. or no question. And so just saying, here's a red line, don't go past this red line. Right. So on the good side of that, you say, all right, now we have to think some more. Is that, is that fair? Uh, th that is, uh, that is fair, yes. And uh, uh, just just to clarify, I'm uh, uh, I'm focusing on this right line here, and it's more like to uh, to tell the existing searches at the LHC whether you can interpret it with certain EFT models instead of just to go beyond and say, okay, can I motivate new searches to explore new parameter zone of the EFT? You you, you see what I'm saying? So. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I still think, though, that it's kind of a binary thing. For example, you know, as you are, if, as you get closer to this red line from the good side, okay, mm -hmm. you would expect that somehow theoretical errors are increasing. And you should see that somehow, you're right? I mean, so, and, and in a search, if somebody told you I have a theory with large theoretical errors, that's going to change your answers. It's not just that you do an analysis, you get an answer and the answer is valid or invalid. What you actually get depends on the, your input uncertainties, right? Including the theoretical uncertainties. And so- uh, Yeah, yeah, o okay. of course. So you're not, I mean, I'm just, gonna, just trying to clarify because I mean, I believe that the the, the thing that you showed at the beginning, which was about, uh, you know, what is the way, you know, LHC working group cannot agree how to do these searches. And I believe that the issues involved there are essentially these kinds of issues. You know, how do we estimate the size of higher order effects and so on? So I think what you're doing is you're saying there are certain cases where you know you just shouldn't do the search at all, period. You shouldn't try to. Uh, but, 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 but if you, you're okay. not <laughs> explaining how to do it, if it is correct. Yeah. That, I mean, that's one side. Yeah, there are yeah. certain, certain cases, like if you're here, if you're here, you, sh you just shouldn't use this EFT as a description. Yeah, right? that's, that's the wrong side of the red line. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But you if you're here, but if you're here, you can still estimate your truncation. Your, you can still estimate your truncation error from here. Right. Yeah, 
it gets into all of those issues. So in that right. speaking group, you know, argument slash discussion, everybody would agree that you can estimate the errors. <laughs> okay, but uh, I think there are still, if you go further about what you're exactly supposed to do, that's where there are different prescriptions and they differ. And there's that's where the disagreement is. I mean, this could still be useful because maybe people are trying to make sense out of searches they shouldn't make sense out of, right? But I'm just so I'm not, I'm just this is not supposed to be a hostile comment. I'm really just trying to clarify the scope here. I think the scope and you know, maybe having a more limited scope is the way to make progress. But to me, the scope looks like this: that you're you're once you're over some line, you say no, don't do it, but on the other side of that line, you're not really giving any specific guidance. I, I basically, I, I largely agree with you, except for this point, that is once you you know you're in this zone, like say you're, you're here, then you know the EFT is valid, then you can use this EFT at this point to interpret the search bound without doing any more clipping. So historically, some with, people say with that no, zero theoretical error. So you're saying you should assign zero theoretical error to the EFT in that entire blue regime. Uh, that's not true. The EFT also always has a truncation error. Right. But you're not telling experimentalists how to incorporate that into their analysis. Oh, so uh, um, yeah, so there are two questions. One is the validity of this truncation. Another is how to assess the error associated with this truncation. And in this talk and in this work I'm talking about, we're not addressing the uncertainty related to that yet, but we're addressing the validity part. Right. Okay, so the LHC EFT work group has strong debate about both the validity and the uncertainty part. Right, so you're just addressing the validity part. Yes. Okay. So the validity part is saying like, so what does it mean for it to be put aside how to estimate the truncation uh, uh, uncertainty, systematic, uh, uh, you know, theoretical uncertainty, but what does it mean for this point to be valid? You need to first say, okay, my, my central value of prediction of signal, right? Apart from uncertainty, right? Central value of the signal strength, signal from this EFT is what? How do you calculate that? How do you use MATGRAPH to simulate that, right? So historically, people say, okay, now you're in five TV zone of the mass here. So when you, when you have an inclusive energy beam from two TV to, to 14 TV, you should toss away any event with center of mass energy bigger than five TV. Just as simulation truth level, toss it. That's your, your like EFT the, prediction. You about throw away partoning a center of mass energy larger than five TV. Yeah, 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 partoning, yeah. That makes sense, right? But the, the, <laughs> this point is showing you that you don't need to do that. Keep all of that. That's a good approximation of the underlying UV theory. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're just, he's just saying that in that regime, the, the don't be afraid of keeping the all fraction of the event, and therefore it actually wouldn't matter if you did your prescription for this observable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, that so is not contradicting that at all. Yeah, but that is a possibility. Is a that's supposing I, I don't know if the if, 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 if uh, okay, I don't know if it's possible that the, the, okay, the, the number of events is small. But uh, since you have energy during behavior, then maybe the, the possibility is sensitivity coming from the being rather than having TV. You, then, then you, you are saying that's not possible. Oh, okay. For example, I, I know the number of events are yeah, small, but what if my signal, in, 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 in the signal in the, in the being, uh, five, let's say 5 TV to 10 TV, my signal is huge. Then you're here. No, 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 that's the total rate, Chatwan. He's saying, what if the low energy bins are dominated by background and the high energy bin has less background? Yeah, 
and the Molson is so even, then it does, then, even though the total rate is well predicted, you're really only sensitive to the high energy bin. So, right. I, I, I'm sorry. You know, I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about the EFT. I view this uh, uh, you know higher dimensional operators as the signal. I mean, first of all, we should never be looking. I mean, we're not going to go to twentieth order in the EFT, right? But but that's particular a case where right. So mathematically, right? If you're here at k equal like dimension equals twenty, your your amplitude is keeping this k equals ten kind of term. That's where exactly your quote unquote the signal is strong. You have a dimension oh. 20 operator generating the signal, and your signal is huge there. That's the situation. Yeah. I think I think the way I would say, think of it, say, I think what Da's point is, is this, is that you've only considered very simple observables, right? So you've considered the total rate, and then you've considered the rate with a single energy type. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, what experimentalists, what you would like an experimentalist to be able to do is to say, I'm going to give you a signal model, okay? And now you be, go and be an experimentalist and find the best way to, ex, you know, separate the signal model from background, right? Mm, mm, uh, so mm. that now, if they only want to do total rates and total rates with some total energy cut, okay, then you could use this as the starting point of an analysis yeah. to yeah. say. How you would do that? Okay, you still would have to worry about right. separating the theoretical uncertainties and so on. But yes. the thing is, is that it's this is very, very far from what uh, an experimentalist would do if you gave them a Monte Carlo that say had some Susie model or some uh, simple. Exactly. Model, yeah. Is they would go and study this model and find all sorts of techniques. Use fancy jet finding algorithms. Mm -hmm. Use fancy background. That, that I totally agree. So, and the thing is, is that then you know, so this other thing, which is just throwing out events if they don't, you know, if they rude that side is too big, that would allow an experimentalist to do all of that. Yeah. And uh, that I agree. And for these observables, the ones you've talked about, they are equivalent. You agree or you uh, no no this is more it this is a, in the sense that it gives you the same answer as to where this red line is yeah it gives you the same answer you may say it's different logic or whatever but it gives you essentially the same answer why well because in the other way of doing it you have some cut on your simulated event and you see what happens when you increase that cut Okay, and if it doesn't stabilize, you would say I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this thing, right? Uh, like that card is here, for example. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's equivalent. I'm I'm saying they're equivalent. I'm not for what you're doing. I believe they are equivalent. In the sense that they give the same answer. Um. Uh, let, let 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 me think. Uh, it's in this example. It's uh, it's not that. Um, so let's say let's say uh, we take a, a, m equal to five TV. Okay, here. So if you don't do any clipping, right? I, I'm referring to your procedure of tossing away events as clipping. Okay, as the 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 LHC EFD work group use the the term. So if you don't impose any clipping, you will say that the bound is here, right? This 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 brown curve here, right? But if you impose the clipping, you will say I choose Emax to be five TeV. My root s is fourteen, so five TeV means zero point three zero point four. So that means I'm taking the last line even smaller than that. So you you will change the curve to here, this one. So then you will see there's no bond at all, right? Because of course, when you cut away those, you don't have bond, right? Because the, the, the series becomes convergent. You, you have no event above 5 TV at, anymore, right? So you will lose this mm. unitary bond. Well, I mean, I don't, we don't, let's see. The clipping thing doesn't know what the, uh, the clipping thing doesn't know what, here you've got some particular uh, uh, you have a 
a particular mass, which is ATV? Let's say five. No, but I mean, I don't care what the number is, but you, you picked a particular mass. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, my plot will tell you five TV mass, uh, mass dimension eight or 10. This is totally fine to use the EFT yeah, as yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, I guess. You don't need to toss away any event above five TV. Just use them. Yeah, I mean, you would see that if you threw them away and it didn't make any difference, you would also find that out, right? The, the <laughs> Right? You will. You're saying that you find that if you just keep, you know, keep the, the, the high energy events don't matter, and if you threw them out, you would find that they didn't matter. Yeah, uh, I think it's equivalent. It's equivalent. Well, let me ask it in a different way, just uh, experimentally. Well, you use this to search for new physics. So first you do find the deviation from the standard model and you fit it with a scale lambda. Well, this high dimension object is suppressed by some scale lambda. If, it, if lambda is bigger than 14 TV, then you are fine, right? Hmm? Yeah. Only so when the lambda is less than 14 TV, let's say you get a lambda which is 5 TV. Hmm. And the problem is that you don't trust that it's really five TV because of this, uh, because of this uh, extension. Hmm. But no matter what, it won't be bigger than fourteen TV, right? Maybe six or it's four instead of five TV. The real number is the real extension. Then does it really matter so much? You you already have a target. You know it's less than. 14 TV, then you should just direct try to find it where it is, right? Ah, yeah. uh, actually, the more question is like, what if you not find a signal, you want to put constraint on the lambda, mm. then that will matter a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you only have a constraint, you, you don't know whether it's, uh, Make sense it's a bigger that. than 5 TV or bigger mm. than 6 TV. That's but, that but. is uh, the case. Uh, but uh, I think the I think the question you could ask I think it's more than that I mean I think that if you did a shoddy analysis you could get an answer of uh, you know five or six TV and the real answer is zero namely you don't have any bound because the uncertainties are so terrible yeah zero is a very strong this zero is uh, no, it's you above. Have, it's got to be above. Yeah, I mean the well, lower bound. Big. Yeah, big, zero in the lower big. bound is very bad. Yes. Okay, so I'm saying that what I'm saying is that the nightmare scenario, I think, you know, is 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 it's worse than just knowing the the number. I mean, the number, if you don't, if you have not accurately taken into account the uncertainties, you could get pure nonsense. You could get something that's just you could get a bound, whereas in fact you should not predict any bound because the theoretical errors are so large. Yeah. I mean, that that is possible somewhere near the red line i would expect that to be the case in fact so as you approach the red line what would be happening is that somehow theoretical errors are getting worse bigger and bigger and bigger until they get so big that it's ridiculous mm -hmm. but even before you get to that point the theoretical errors could get so big that there's not any meaningful search that's true too. I, I think the concern right. is that uh, if uh, the new phase scale is really low, that's uh, the ATV or something, but uh, there's some cancellation effect, uh, which uh, no, but but make uh, it does disappear <laughs> from your experimental data. Then you think of well, there's no new phase until even at the fourteen. No, but that would be a cancellation would be in your model, so I mean you wouldn't be fooled by that. Because you have an actual model, and that you are interested in interference effects, and they're predicted by your model. I don't think you would be fooled by that. What once once you once you accept the validity, you can further talk about the uncertainty. You can start simulating the you know sampleizing the categories of UV series, and say, okay, typically this dimension eight Wilson coefficient will be 
of this size, you know, with some randomness of right and to, to sample uh, corrections on that to sample the truncation uh, uncertainties. Uh, because if you don't know the Boson coefficient, of course, you don't know how big the uncertainty is, right? So you're, if you're truncating at dimension six, you're ignoring dimension eight, dimension 10, but you need to sample those sizes based on your some general categories of UV series. Say this, this class of UV series typically gives you one loop surprise, the value of this dimension eight Boson coefficient or that can, you know, you can start talking about those things and, and, and then uh, try to come up with some 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 prescription, and that's also where the the LHC uh, uh, EFT work group cannot agree on like how to precisely do that part. Um, but but yeah yeah the the, the uncertainty is also a, a, a big problem. Um, Are they agreeing that you, you can do dimension six, truncate dimension six, not including dimension eight? Do they agree on that part? No no. No, no because the dimension, dimension six also have the problem to square, right? So any amplitude has this dimension six part, but if you calculate anything, it's cross section or anything, you need to mod square that. When you no, mod square- I agree, that agree. That linear normal spectrum, you can, uh, if, if, if I think in, in, in your analysis, if uh, you can safely neglect the spectrum, then you are okay for dimension six. But if you include the spectrum that the future dimension, I'm trying to say, uh, are they agreeing you including dimension six plus dimension eight? That makes sense. Or they don't agree. You need you need you need including dimension ten, dimension twelve, infinity to power. What are they agreeing this at this moment? I'm just trying to understand. They 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 have argument over like uh if you keep to dimension six, yeah, linear. That that is when you square it, you drop the 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 square mm -hmm. piece. Then mm -hmm. that's fine. Okay, that, that's I, one I, version. That okay, that, they, they agree, that's fine. Mm. But then there are people arguing that you can keep the dimension six squared piece as a uh, guess of the, the dimension Error. eight effect, right? Yeah. Because dimension eight interference is same as the dimension six square. But oh. they, they have different selection rules and different, right? Different uh, uh, detailed uh, patterns. So, so people arguing over like, does it make sense to keep dimension six square piece or you know, alone dropping dimension eight interference. Oh, that that one actually is that doesn't make sense. But but uh, I think dimension six square can and I agree with you. Dimension six square can be used as an estimation of the. the they don't. They didn't achieve any agreement on that. On, on just they, that even side. on that, they don't agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think for good reason because I mean the. The, the 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 relative size of dimension six and dimension eight terms mm -hmm. is completely model dependent. Right. Only right. right. couple theory, the dimension right. eight terms be relatively less important compared to a weakly couple theory. So it depends on we we know as theorists it's not really model independent, you know, when you so there yeah. is no <laughs> there is no universal answer. Pretending that there's a universal answer is not going to make progress. Okay, okay, right? Yeah. But, but would they agree if you put in dimension six and the dimension eight effect? They but, agree uh, we will uh, never go beyond dimension eight in practice, okay. in, in reality, this is not achievable. They also agree that we cannot simultaneously probe dimension six and dimension eight. You cannot design a search to simultaneously try to constrain dimension six and dimension eight. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I wonder how representative is the example you studied. It's based on an S channel mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. which you, you do have more dramatic effect because the, 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 the propagator can go to zero when you go on the shelf. Oh, there's a way. Uh, and you have yeah. if T channel, you don't have this effect. Right. Now, in S channel, if you really have M less than 14 TV, then you should do a direct search to see, to, to yeah. find the resonance directly, right? Rather yeah. than yeah. Yeah. talking yeah. about some EFT. No, no, no. But if I have resonance, I think ATV probably will never find it for direct search. So, uh, just, uh, you know, for T channel, you never have this dramatic tensor, well, whatever changing propagator. Hmm? So it may may not, well, I don't know, behavior may be quite different. Second, oh, we have we have T channel as part of our paper. 
Yeah. Uh, sorry? The T-channel example is in our paper. I'm just not showing it in this talk. Okay. But yeah, it does work exactly the qualitative behavior is all the same. It's even mm -hmm. cleaner because of this. Uh, so it's just, a, for example, okay, back to here. This is this, this, is this curve here, right? So T channel is alternating. It changes sign because T is negative. Yeah. So yeah, it's approaching it from both sides and then, then you know, farther like both sides like that. Um, yeah, also, this is also based on momentum. Extension, right? You have yes. extension, so you, you, uh, when you go to higher energies, uh, this moment, well, yeah, it becomes more important. But uh, in terms of operator, there are also these peaks the operator which you get. Just oh, uh, I would yeah. argue the when the momentum one energy is energy more case. dangerous, right? So I'm addressing the more dangerous one hmm. because the other ones are basically surprised by instead of. Uh, uh, S over M, right? Root S over M is surprised by V over M, but right. V is just the, you know, 200 GV, so that's small. Yeah. yeah. So they are less dangerous, right? Right, right. Yeah. I mean, so this I is the most agree it's a matter of practice, but mm -hmm. uh, from what I can tell, the electroweak working group is so lost that, that this is relevant. So, for example, you know, they one of the cases that I heard discussed by a talk from the LA from the working group was uh, in triple gauge boson. Don't use the dimension six square. Yeah, they yeah, get yeah, negative yeah. cross section. Yeah. And of course, what they should conclude from this is that the search is ridiculous. Yeah. It has so crappy sensitivity. There have been decades of people doing research so you know they 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 i agree that they 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 are but for favorable searches the issue is more you know is, is a little bit more subtle it's not it's 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 how do you like i said for me it's the question of how do you estimate theoretical uncertainty because a a, an EFT has a more complicated type of theoretical uncertainty than a mm -hmm. perturbative model, right? Mm -hmm. If the model is perturbative, you say, well, everything is good. The theory predictions are all good to 1%. And that's independently pretty much of the energy or what observable it is, right? <laughs> But that's but that's the price you need to pay when you go to an EFT because you claim EFT is is kind of sort of a con, you know uh, covering you know various kinds of UV models, right? So when you talk about uncertainty in a particular perturbative UV model, you are just talking about one model. But in EFT, you are talking about right unknown situation of the UV model, right? right. right. So there are priors that come in. That yeah. is, there's another type of theoretical uncertainty, which is your prior. Yeah, that's right. That's the theory space, right? Yeah. Eventually, yeah. if we really are going to do this, we have to face these things. So that's why I was mentioning sampling over the theory space, right? The sampling over the Volson coefficient is basically sampling over the theory space. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't believe in sampling over theory space. I believe it's <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you're so say if you're in a SUSI model, how do you estimate that systematic you know error due to it's you know the fact that it could not be SUSI, it could be like like some extra dimension model? I, I think it's a total waste so of time to average over three, <laughs> including <in> SUSI. <laughs> that's not going to stop anybody from doing it, but I think it's a total waste of time. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I just think that what I would rather see is just. Make some assumptions that I can understand and show me the results. Yeah. You know, you know, it's cheap to consider 10 different assumptions, right? If you make 10 different plots, 10 different versions of the same plots, that would be more informative than some mysterious averaging over, you know, over multiple. Uh, by, by, by the way, I'm not, not sure. Oh, that is a strongly coupled theory scenario. Uh, you can pick up. Some, some dimension eight operator plus dimension six operator and including them six square and then that particular dimension eight operator. Mm -hmm. Then you can you know, safely neglect the dimension 10 and the other dimension eight operator. 
your infrastructure still makes sense if we have some strong coupling. That 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 is is possible. I'm just trying to to mention. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But probably if you find a general case, like a general theory, theory space, like a Marcus said, like sample or or the theory, mm. uh, I, I agree with Marcus. I'm not sure it makes sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, are you guys are you guys continuing on with this? Uh, yeah. I mean, I uh, yeah. I uh, I and we're we're thinking about you know some real case right. This is like a demonstration just in principle kind of a behavior right. So this this uh, or personally I'm just more interested in you know this kind of this kind of behavior. You know um you know I I was wondering if you can do some you know kind of more theoretical resummation of this kind of thing like a boreal resummation things like that so connection to those uh, renormal thing. saying uh, but uh, uh, but practically right towards the LHC thing like we're we're uh, thinking about just the, the real case like a three body like monojet example um, uh, did by you know analyzed by people in the past and then by cli imposing clipping uh, we strongly believe at least I strongly believe that's an over conservative analysis and um, so if you now in the validity zone of the EFT, you don't have to impose clipping and your signal will be stronger. Um, you know, your EFT signal will be stronger in that third channel. And then you can place a stronger bond on the EFT parameter, um, but still UV robust. Okay, so I think you know the the past so analysis. Flipping scale to infinity, do you reproduce your analysis? Sorry, if you if you send the clipping scale to infinity. Yeah, that's essentially that. Yes. So yeah, that, that should be part of any flipping analysis. Would be how does it depend on the clipping scale? The problem is that they parameterize the EFT. They introduce the clipping scale as one of the parameters of the EFT, and then they they present this as. And you're choosing it to be infinity. Yeah, you should just go to the slides where this is infinity, right? Um, I mean, I think it depends on your priors. I mean, if you if you think that there's a low scale resonance, then you should clip at a low scale, and then you should compare that to the actual resonance search, and you will find that the resonance search is better, and then you'll realize that you should take the clipping scale higher. Hmm. I mean, you're, you're, I mean, so I mean, I think, yeah, I think that it's fine to, to the most, in, in some sense, I don't know, optimistic in terms of your bound case is to take the flipping scale to infinity. And in some searches, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. So. Hmm. Yeah, so that, that's, that's what we, we will work work on um for this. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know. I mean, I, like I said, to me, to me, I believe that you know there just are more parameters in an EFT search. You know, for example, in a in a strongly coupled theory. The resonance are, are sort of as heavy as possible given the strength of the lowest higher dimension operators, right? Whereas in a weakly coupled theory, the, the, the dimension eight and higher terms are relatively more important, right? Mm -hmm. And that is just, we don't know that. So that's just a parameter in the theory, whether we want it to be or not, right? Um, you know the scale of which so you can think of it as the scale of which the lowest resonance comes in and so i would want to see not just the case actually the case the clipping scale as large as possible is the strongest uh, possible coupling it corresponds to the model with the strong coupling in the uv right because you're trying to make the resonance scales be as high as you possibly can but i would also like to see what the results are for you know for 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 lower values. Um yeah. Mm. I, I mean for example, 
I mean, I do believe that that uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I <laughs> the for the next 10 years of the experimental program, I don't think we're that the, the precision measurements are going to probe anything other than crazy strongly coupled models that we don't even know what they are. Is, is there any weakly coupled model that we can discover more easily by doing precision measurements as opposed to just doing direct searches? I mean, not with light particles, of course, if they're, you know, I don't know, maybe. So I thought, yeah, I, 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 is there any example of that? Um, well, one example is like they come covered with PQ bar from the data, but I mean, very, very special example. So there is some, and there are a few examples. But that's a weekly couple of theory, but it, because that lab is so clean, at yeah. present kind of, in principle, you can reach 18 PV for the weekly couple of resonance. Right. Mm. It, it, it seems like I'm doing a large environment. Uh, yeah. But that, uh, apart from that, I'm not sure. Mm. Okay. Mm. But in the main, I mean, that's my impression is that what, most of what we're testing is, uh, yeah. is some weird, where if we see a, an, an anomaly in some precision measurement and we don't see an anomaly in any other direct search, we're going to be forced to think about some really weird strongly coupled theory. Yeah. With maybe one or two exceptions. Mm. Right. Yeah, but, but will we observe deviation from Precision. <laughs> I don't. Well, no, I don't think we will. I, mean, I thought that you will just <laughs> mostly get bombed. Yeah. I, I don't think, I, for, for precisely that reason, my theoretical prejudice says we won't observe any anomalies. Okay, <laughs> or we'll see something in direct searches. I mean, right? That still seems, uh, but there's not as much face space for that, right? Mm. That's the problem is that we don't get very much. Yeah, the reach for that, the reach increase for that in high luminosity LHC is usually not so impressive. Mm. Anyway, so I think, I think, I mean, I think I understand your, you know, I think yeah. I quoted you on Dr. Sager just said. Yes. And so I'll quote you. So you might want to cut off the ad. <laughs> so the Congress <laughs> based on what you said. Right. right. But, uh, it's only 